Welcome back to my closet. As a huge, well-known lover of Sherlock Holmes, I have found myself quite often distraught. Distraught by a lack of reverence for the text when it comes to a description for a Mr. Dr. John Watson. Now, he has been depicted in many different ways for many different reasons, and I'd like to talk about all of those with you today. Today's episode is called In Defense of Watson. I'm Dodger, and on behalf of all of us, welcome to the Sherlock Holmes fandom. You do know what you're drinking is meant for eye surgery. Now, declaring one actor over another as your true version of a character is not uncommon at all. Everybody loves a James Bond. Everybody loves a Batman. Most people are ambivalent about a Watson. Just for fun, let's make a blanket statement about people. But we tend to latch onto whatever represents our generation, typically. So there will be one actor who's written one way, and that's our representation of that character. That's like the perfect form, right? But then eventually there's a new screenwriter, there's a new actor, and thus there is a new character, even though it's residing under the exact same name. So building off of that, it's the changes to Watson's original form that really bothers Sherlock Holmes purists. For a long time, the questions being asked about Watson were the same questions that we even now ask about female characters. Why is he constantly getting into trouble? Why is he constantly being saved? Why is he so stupid and clumsy? I mean, I guess he's like kind of precious looking. This was not always the case if we go back to the Doylemeister himself. If we uh, consult the book, in the very, very first story, A Study in Scarlet, this is the description of Watson. Whatever have you been doing with yourself, Watson? You are thin as a lab and brown as a nut. He goes on to be described in The Adventure of Charles Augustus Milverton, which is a short story in the Sherlock Holmes world, as strongly built, an athlete, a thick strong neck, and a small mustache. For timeline purposes, this was written in 1887. So for many of you watching right now, that description is nothing like what's in your mind because most of the time, the way he's depicted in media is decidedly un-Watson-y. Now, I'd like to make this very clear. He was never intended to be extremely smart. In modern day mystery novels, the character who kind of like takes a while to understand what's going on and, and, you know, states the obvious a lot is called a Watson. And typically that character is very necessary because it's somebody that we can connect with, who will ask all of the same questions that we're wondering and it keeps us from getting swallowed up in all of the weird happenstance of what's going on in a mystery novel. But that's now, we get ahead of ourselves. Let's go back to 1900. So at that time, there was a 30 second film that we know to be the very first Sherlock Holmes film, as far as we know, called Sherlock Holmes Baffled. And I bet you can guess since it's only 30 seconds long, it had very little to do with Sherlock Holmes, and in fact, Watson was not there at all. In 1916, there was a silent film that was made that was based off of a Sherlock Holmes stage play that was very popular at the time. Now, unfortunately, there is no known complete copy of this film, and only the pieces that are left intact are kept in a gilded cage of gold, I assume. So Watson was in this one, but we only have pictures of him, and you can't even really see his face, which is sad. What is considered to be the most accurate early Watson was Ian Fleming. He was in a series of early, early 1930s films that made him a sweet, capable, awesome sidekick. But also in the 1930s, our most well-known Watson came to be. In the late 1930s, we got a very new kind of Watson that was portrayed by Nigel Bruce, and this is our iconic Watson. Still to this day, he's portly and bumbling and not very smart and really just precious. He's precious Watson. It really utilized that strong trope of the unlikely duo, and there are even historians that look into why this Watson was so successful. He became so beloved despite purists really just hating him. Nigel Bruce's avuncular presence provided the perfect counterbalance to Rathbone's briskly omniscient sleuth. It's also very widely believed that if not for Bruce's depiction of Watson, Watson might have just disappeared. Up to this point, he felt like kind of a throwaway character. He wasn't super necessary because he wasn't filling the same role as in the books. And, you know, maybe he would have lost more and more and more of his importance until he wasn't really even a character at all. Which I think we can all agree is very different from modern adaptations of Sherlock Holmes and also what Arthur Conan Doyle would have wanted. So since then, jumping forward so that this video isn't a million years long, we've had 
um, Robot Watson, we've had Dog Watson, we've had uh, the Sherlock Holmes stories where Sherlock is like transported into the future and everybody from his time is dead so you know, no Watson. We've had Russian Watson, we've had Mouse Watson, we've had Video Game Watson who despite many many games never seems to get smarter or better at telling when people are dead even though he's a doctor. We even had our very first female Watson, played by the lovely Margaret Collin in 1987. And yet, so many of them are so far from the original description. So, let's jump to now, because I think my generation's first real adaptation of Sherlock Holmes was the Robert Downey Jr. one. This was like the first time that we saw glimpses of Arthur Conan Doyle's original Watson, and I had so many friends who were like, um, I don't know about this, is Watson like supposed to be mega hot? Yes. He's a fit war vet who comes back and is like, yeah, I'll keep solving crimes, what? This is way more like the Watson that I remember reading, and they got to maintain that unlikely duo thing because Watson wound up more militaristic and strict, and we got to see this Sherlock who is all over the place and overwhelmed with ennui and just, ah. Other Sherlocks up to this point, while they were eccentric, um, were typically pretty strict. Very, um, how do I say this without? British. They were very British. Actually, there have been some Sherlocks that are the completely other side of the spectrum where they're just like, oh my gosh, we totally solved a crime so jazzed, let's go get food! But this is not a video about Sherlock. Maybe I'll make one of those later. This is about Watson. Now the BBC Sherlock show, I love, it's very popular, but I could pick it apart for days. Today we're just gonna focus on Watson terrible sweaters, which I also love. Martin Freeman's Watson was almost carefully crafted to be like this weird mid-zone between Nigel Bruce's Watson and Arthur Conan Doyle's Watson. So we have this mishmash that's like skilled and exasperated and haunted while at the same time being really useless. I just feel like at this point we're so much better at character development than we used to be that now is the time to have really interesting layered Watsons, and we don't really get that in the BBC version, which is really sad. He's mostly just there to be like, oh Sherlock, how the devil did you come up with that? My word! Like, Watson more often than not, across all of Sherlock Holmes media, is a damsel in distress, and I think that that's really underutilizing him. Also, Martin Freeman sounds nothing like my, uh, really bad attempt at that British accent, wow. Elementary Watson, while not being a man, Man, does give us that awesome, strong, powerful, strict Watson that a lot of us are really engaged by. And elementary is like one of the only times that all of the characters surrounding Sherlock Holmes don't just like put up with Sherlock Holmes. Watson gets to be a catalyst for him to change and she also changes by knowing him as well. So we see so much development there. And I realize that taking really flat characters and having them blossom into incredible people is way easier with a TV show that doesn't just have three episodes per season. Anyway, my final thoughts on this, and the reason that I even decided to make this video in the first place, is because I find it fascinating that Doyle created Watson, and Watson has been turned into so many different forms of the sidekick, which is a very one-dimensional role typically. Fight the backlash in the late 30s when there seemed to be this complete 180 to Watson's character, I think it's really proven that changes to him have made him helpful and interesting and so necessary as a foil to Sherlock because Sherlock is decidedly interesting no matter what. And so without an interesting narrator, what sort of story do we have? To fans of John Watson, old and new, I hope that you found this entertaining and welcome to the fandom.